Thank you for coming to our session. Um, you're here to learn about how we have incorporated immersive relevant learning for all of our students. My name is Hannah Holgan. I am the founder and director of Masterpiece Academy. We have Mercedes Grant here, who's founder and director of Path of Life Learning. Ashley Bradbreck, who is launching this fall with Riverside Academy. And then we have uh, Becky McNichols here, who has Rooted Life Academy. So we are so glad you joined us today um, and to hear about our experience running our micro schools so all right well thank you so much for being here I know there are so many wonderful sessions and it's hard to choose so I appreciate that you guys came to ours um, we have some objectives up here we are illustrating the impact of micro schools on student learning and engagement we are also going to share details about the element elements of what makes relevant and immersive learning happen in our spaces and we're going to shed the light on some challenges and obstacles that we have faced and um, things that maybe you are also facing as well to know that you're not alone. And we're going to provide actionable steps, some things that you can take away from our time here and hopefully implement in your spaces or even just start some conversations where you can connect with others who might be experiencing um, some of the th same journeys as you and being able to feel like you're not alone and that we are in community and in collaboration. So yes, thank you again for being here this morning with us. Uh, this is one of our favorite quotes, and I think it's important to start with a quote to kind of um, set the stage. Um, it says, learning can only happen when a child is interested. If he is not interested, it's like throwing marshmallows at his head and calling it eating. Um, in order for us to have this immersive and relevant learning, the kids have to have a little bit of a buy-in too. Um, we need to be presenting them with things that they are engaged in, they do want to learn about. Otherwise, we're just throwing worksheets at them, um, talking at their face, and, and hoping they absorb something. Um, and it's just, it's not what we want to do, and it's not how we feel is the best practice. And so we're going to talk about some of those things here um, this morning with you all. This is so weird with four people up here. It's like not big enough. So I'll just take center stage. Um, no, but um, I like the way that you kind of talked about like what our traditional education system looks like and how it is not working for every student. So we have four models that offer very different things, but then very similar things. Um, so Masterpiece Academy, I like to call us all experts, right? Um, Hannah is the expert in field trips. Yes, there is such a thing as being an expert at field trips. She does unit studies, individualized core learning, and enrichment clubs uh, at Path of Life Learning, which is my micro school. We have enrichment classes, field trips, projects and research-based learning. And then at Rooted Life Academy, uh, Becky's micro school, she has personalized instruction, project-based learning, student-led learning, and multiple age um, learning. And then we have uh, Ashley, who is at Riverside, who offers workshops, engagement, individualized instruction. And the beauty of that is that Ashley is getting ready to launch, but she's already in practice um, this year doing, you, you quit teaching this like past year, right? And um, she is now kind of working in these services and finding out what works and what doesn't work um, and then learning from all of us. So we have so much to offer you guys today and we're really, really excited. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about Masterpiece Academy and my so-called expertise in field trips and unit studies. Um, just a little bit of background of Masterpiece Academy. I'm finishing up my second year. Um, I am in Nebraska. I serve K-12 students. And yes, they all go on the same field trip. And we operate Monday through Friday from 9 to 12. Tuesdays is our field trip day, um, mainly because we're displaced from our location on Tuesdays. And so it's kind of forced us to be creative. Um, there's a classical education homeschool co-op that takes over all the area churches on Tuesdays. And so in my first year, we had Fun Friday, where it gave me the flexibility to do field trips. But when I decided that home wasn't the best place for Masterpiece Academy to thrive, we moved to a church, and that's when we learned that Classical Conversations takes over. And so on Tuesdays, now we have Field Trip Tuesdays, and it's great. It's a highlight. The kids love it. I joked with them that we're not doing it next year, and they were like, we're not coming back. Okay, well, 
it's coming back, so it's fine. Um, so some examples of field trips I'll get into, but you can see them all involved when we're at field trips. They're immersed into that learning experience. Um, in the very top center photo, we went to the Omaha Police Department Crime Lab, and the kids got to experience what does a forensic scientist do? How does that look? Can I participate? And so here in this activity, they're looking at fingerprinting. And that was just a really practical way for kids to say, oh, and at the time, we were studying the human body and understanding that as a masterpiece, we all have unique fingerprints, and that's one way that we can use it to solve crimes. And so that was fun for them. That's been a highlight. They did talk about blood splatter. Some of our students weren't a big fan, but it's the reality of um, the job. Uh, we have a really great science museum in Omaha, Nebraska as well. Um, so they're over there working together. Um, we went to the community college. They have a health science program, and we were able to look at what different departments in health scientists kids could explore. So at 16 years old, they could start their CNA if they wanted to, and that was like light bulbs for some kids that were considering the medical field, because we could start that. Um, they actually have, this one's called a Sindaver. We were a little bit worried about a Sindaver, um, but it was really great to talk about the human body organs and then come and touch a synthetic cadaver and actually pull out the pancreas and pull out the intestines. And they're like, whoa. Um, but it really brought everything to life. Um, we went to the courthouse where there happens to be a really old jail. Um, at the top, that's not used anymore, but the kids got to see what it's like, the confinements, the reality of that. Um, my Spanish teacher took some of our kids down um, to what in our town is South Omaha to do an experience, and then we have whole group unit study lessons going on in the other pictures there. Um, so what's fun about doing unit studies and field trips, right now we're studying North American birds, and so next Tuesday we are going bird watching at a local um, habitat, and so we can connect things for kids that's right there in their community. Um, so it's interdisciplinary in the sense that we're studying birds, we're studying the geography where these birds are, the anatomy of those birds, we're touching science, we're looking at um, legally what laws surround birds and their habitats and their protection, and so we're crossing in. Um, we are a Christian micro school, and so we even talk about where birds show up in the Bible. And so we are crossing all the pathways which make it relevant, which make it immersive, because it's not just 45 minutes of math, 45 minutes of science, social studies, and so on. It's all woven together. The only thing that our unit studies don't include is math. That is a separate, separate topic. But what we love is this last month, month prior, I guess, it's already April, um, that the kids this year vote for the units next year. So the whole reason we studied birds and the human body and dinosaurs and space is because the kids last year voted for that. And so the kids get to take ownership of their learning and what they're doing. Um, so these are what they voted on for this coming year. We're going to study rocks and minerals. Can't say I'm super excited, but they are, so I'll get excited. Um, we're doing U.S. government because it's an election year. And so no better way to just teach the government right teach about the government right when it's happening um, we're going to do a big continent study with Australia psychology and then North American forest animals each of these unit projects we finish up with a summative project versus taking a test and so they have to demonstrate their learning in a lot more of an authentic way um, we bring in guest speakers yesterday I was absent and life went on, but we had a dinosaur expert come in and do an assembly, which I still find to be a gross word, but an assembly or a pep rally, but the kids got to learn from an, another area expert about dinosaurs. But we have found that the learning can go deep. We're not going an inch deep and a mile wide. We're going head first in the deep end with these units, and it's been fun. Um, but you can see a list there of a snapshot of the different field trips that we've gone on. So you could imagine that when we're studying space, we went to the Space Museum. So we're connecting their community, and it's also fun for the community to get involved. We went to the optometrist, and we were able to see. Um, they had a special device where you can, they scan their eyes to see the oil glands at the bottom to determine if the kids have had too much screen time. Um, thankfully, a couple parents attended that field trip too, so they got to see the harsh reality of what that screen time does to their eyes. Um, but now all of them want glasses, <laughs> which <laughs> I can't relate, but 
Um, they found it fun. We went to the culinary program, so we're really bringing their community to the forefront of their minds, like allowing them to just love learning again. Um, my kids are so sad that we're counting down the days, but they're sad, not um, excited for summer. They wish that there could be more. And so I just love that we can provide a joyful experience for them. So that's Masterpiece. Hi, um, so this is Path of Life Learning. Oh my gosh, these pictures, let me just tell you. Um, I am in Yorktown, Virginia, and we serve kindergarten through fifth grade. We are also faith-based. Um, we have a, an approach that, that has academics, and it also we also offer enrichment. And when I got into this, I was like, oh, man, this is really cool because I was a public educator, and I never, like, I feel like the kids, like, once you get into sixth grade, you get to, like, play a, an instrument, and you get to take an art class, um, and you get some of that autonomy. But I started hearing about micro schools, and then I started hearing about how um, homeschoolers, like, let their kids kind of dive into all the things that are interesting to them. And I was like, okay, this is really weird. So let's, like, let's jump in. Um, so... I decided that I was going to take out some of those public education pieces that I really did not appreciate, um, like sitting in desks all day and having students just like completing worksheets and me leading them through their learning journey instead of just being their guide. And then I started saying like, okay, who in my community can offer these kids something? Who knows how to do X, Y, or Z? Um, so we have enrichment classes, we have projects, and we have field trips at Path of Life. And I didn't intend for all of this to happen. Um, the kids kind of guided me that way. Um, so while I was thinking about field trips, I was like, oh, my gosh, let's go to the Science Center. And we did. But we didn't really associate it the same as um, as Hannah, where she was like, we study this and then we go on a field trip about it. And, and then I started rethinking, like, why aren't we doing that? Um, and so this is kind of what has, has been birthed as a result of kind of listening to the students. Um, so I love these pictures. I'm obsessed with pictures. I, I take pictures and do videos all the time. Not yet, not yet. No, I got to take, I got to show you guys, um, posture and prayer outside on the lawn, which is so cool, parent-led. We have our students doing entrepreneurship and building, oh, this is entrepreneurship over here, where they are challenged with building this crazy spaghetti tower with a marshmallow on top, and we, we definitely clearly had a winner. Um, we have four acres out of outdoor space, and this is us with my magical children um, taking a hike. We we are always outside, and we love that. Um, we did. We went to the science center. We dissected a brain after we did our brain study. Um, we extracted DNA from strawberries, and then we did a. Black History Month project where the students were able to um, dig into their project uh, any way that they wanted to. And that was really, really beautiful um, for the students. Um, so enrichment classes, it's kind of gone a couple different ways this year. Initially, we started off with um, Power Hour. So we had Power Hour, and the students were able to pick whatever class they wanted to do. Um, so some of the things that we uh, incorporated in Power Hour, Legos, board games, cooking class, um, I, just a plethora of things that they were interested in. And we kind of, like, let them play and, like, okay, you could do that. Um, and then we also have a, a time that I started reaching out to parents. I was like, all right, I don't know how to play an instrument except the recorder. And it's like, hot cross buns, hot cross buns. Y'all can appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I started calling on my parents and saying, hey, guys, come in and teach us something. So we got a music teacher. She's now hired to be my kindergarten and first grade teacher for next year. I'm so excited because <laughs> I love to sing, but I'm horrible at it. Um, sign language. We got, a sign, we got two sign language teachers, one for our little kids that taught it through singing um, and music, which is really easy and adorable. So if you are, like, into sign or you just, like, 
feel like you want your kids to have that. It's adorable. You should definitely pick it up. And then we had an ASL teacher for our older kids as well. We have art. Actually, I found someone on a cheap or free homeschool resources group um, just for you guys to know. Uh, I found someone that is an artist and I was like, hey, will you build a curriculum for us? And he did. So my students are learning to sketch and draw on a high school level, even though they're they're in third through fifth grade. Um, so that's been really beautiful. They do that all virtually. That's awesome. Um, I teach Spanish, <laughs> okay? And it's really fun. Um, and they're learning a lot. We have posture and prayer. We have garden uh, family gardening. Uh, it's beautiful. The student-led clubs. Um, I just wanted to give you guys some of the options that I used just so that if you're thinking about how would I ever afford this or how is this possible in real life, um, I do a tuition share with parents or I can just give them a private payment. It's really up to them. If they don't need tuition share, then I can just pay them. Um, it can be adult-led. It can be student-led. Um, Obviously, our entrepreneurship program is going to be more um, student-led. Um, you can use grant funding. Vela Grant was amazing. I used the grant for that. Um, there are lots of other little mini micro-grants that you can get out there. Um, I prefer my students and parents to commit six weeks at least, or they can come in and teach a one-time class, like composting or whatever. And then we also have uh, virtual or in-person, like I mentioned. Um, so these are kind of the fun things that we've done this year. Um, I like to make sure that we have interest-based. Um, I'm not going to teach the students about something they don't care about. And even like uh, rocks and minerals, I feel like once they choose it, then I choose it too. And I adopt it and then it becomes really fun. Like everything can be fun, right? Um, I like for the program to be free, to free and flexible. Um, one of the things that I found are that my students are learning to be presenters. And I think that's so cool because we're using a program, we're, we're, we're using two. So the first program that we're using is called Kidvation. They are actually here in a vendor. And the students are learning to be entrepreneurs. They're building a product. And these are kids that are like seven years old through 11 years old. They're building this product based on a, a challenge that they found in their own life. And then they're pitching it. That we're going to go to the library and they are going to pitch it to strangers their families, like their whole, they have to build a prototype. And it's like so cool. I never intended for them to be uh, presenters. And then we're also using Rock by Rock and Jeff is here and he wears a backpack and a blue shirt. And uh, um, that one is also super incredible because the kids get to actually participate in a world that has nothing to do with self. Um, they are really thinking about the world around them and, and how this is being kind of transformed into a whole program I think is really, really exciting. So this is Path of Life and we're having so much fun. Okay, so I'm Becky McNichols, and I'm just so happy to be here, and um, I came last year for the first time, and it was amazing, and so this being the second year is just equally amazing. Um, I am in Kansas, and Kansas State, not um, Kansas City, but like Missouri, but Kansas. Um, I was a public school teacher for 15 years. I in, um, actually taught in Japan for two years. I've lived in Washington and taught there, um, California, and then now Kansas. And um, Rooted Life Academy was started because my own daughter became uh, school-aged and I saw public school from a completely different space and God put it on my husband's heart first that we should do something different and I thought he was crazy. Um, and then God put it on my heart and Rooted Life Academy started in 2022. I focused on kinder through second grade because that was my wheelhouse. I had eight students and then this year as my second year, I, um, all of my eight students returned and I have 11. And next year, we are moving from my basement into our workshop. Uh, we have four acres, and my husband, who is incredibly talented, has built all of our furniture and uh, just created what's in my head as far as what it looks like. He's created it um, out of 
wood, mostly. Um, and so as we are building this workshop, I've already had two years. I mean, the workshop's already built, but he's renovating it, right? So I've had two years to see what works and what we love, and now we're making that come to life in a, in a much bigger space that includes a loft um, that I'm most excited about. And I'm aiming to have 20 students, God willing, and hire on another teacher right now. It's just me, so uh, that's really exciting. And um, all of these fun things that we're doing right now in my basement, this is my basement, um, will be replicated and expanded upon in my workshop. Um, our program is faith-based. We have full-time options for Monday through Thursday, and then we also have part-time options of two to three days a week, and I find that fam families love that flexibility to be able to partner with me. I have these four things that I feel like I do really well and um, that I'm continuing to learn about and grow on. And as Mercedes and Hannah talked a lot about like student-led learning and project-based learning, I'm gonna be focusing on personalized instruction and multi-age setting. So these are um, some of our activities that we'll, uh, we do daily and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them in a coming slide, but I wanted to start out with, as I'm focusing um, on multi-age education, multi-age setting, I think a lot of us think of that one-room schoolhouse, and we've all seen pictures of the one-room schoolhouse where there's rows and there's a teacher up front, and um, I think uh, Little House on the Prairie comes to mind, right? This is actually a picture of a one-room schoolhouse that my grandma taught in, in the 1940s, 1950s, and it's actually a two-room schoolhouse. Um, I want to point this out. It's kind of hard to see, but I think this is really cool. I used to drive by um, on family trips and see this one-room schoolhouse, and I always saw this part right here. And it's really hard to see because it's covered in snow, but basically it's this tunnel tube thing that comes out from the second floor, and I always thought it was a slide, right? Like, it's so cool. There's a slide coming out of the second floor of this old school building. Well, it's actually their fire escape, um, and so while it's not intended to be a slide. I keep telling my husband that we should add a slide to our workshop. He's not quite sold, but I think I might be able to convince him eventually. Um, so as I talk, talked about One Room Schoolhouse, um, combining that with multi-age education, we've come a long way since the Little House on the Prairie and all of those old pictures that we've seen, right? As uh, Mercedes and Hannah mentioned, like we're not sitting at desks in these settings, and I think that is such a beautiful thing that we have the opportunity to do in our settings. And there's so many other things that as we think about educating multiple different ages in one space, like we have so much freedom and creativity to do those things. And it is so inspiring to be able to hear those ideas and practice them and see them come to life and be able to see their success. So I've written up a couple of things that I do and that I think really encap really encompasses multi-age education, but also personalized instruction. And I think. Both of those you can kind of relate to which came first, the chicken or the egg, because they're so hand in hand in this setting that it's hard to differentiate which one started which, right? Which direction it goes, because they just really go so well together. As a previous um, public school classroom teacher, uh, we differentiate a lot in our classrooms. We do small group. We have so many ways to meet the individual needs of our learners, and they're all the same age. And so as I have been a part of this movement, I've had teachers reach out to me and they say, how, they ask, how do you reach all of these different age, ages and abilities? And I think that we need to remember how we do that in the classroom, if you come from the classroom already. We do that already. Um, it just looks a little different because the kids are different sizes and they're different ages. So a lot of the things that I do um, incorporate their ages and abilities, but outside of that age grouping and the grade level grouping, it's more ability grouping or interest level grouping or different ways to bring the kids together to see where they're at, what they need, where they're going, and what they're interested in. So through small groups with phonics and math, that's a little bit more tied to their ability levels. I teach um, where they're at and what they need. And then we do a lot of whole group things like our science and social studies unit projects and project based things where the kids are learning similar topics like space or where we did um, rocks and minerals and all of those concepts, we can teach and learn all at the same whole group lesson. We can just expect a different outcome from our students. They're not all 
writing paragraphs, right? The, kindergartner, the kindergartners might be drawing a picture of what they learned about for space and labeling it, whereas the older kids are doing some of their own research and they are synthesizing that and doing what's important or what feels right to them by making a presentation of a poster or a game or something like that. So we can teach a lot of this, the concept whole group and then just expect a different outcome. And I think that is relevant in our, in our society, right? We're all working together. We're learning from one another. And how what, what we have to contribute looks different, but it doesn't mean it's any less valuable because it's not the same. Um, we also do a lot of partnering up. That's one of the things that I have especially worked on this year is to partner my students in their wonderful abilities with somebody else that they can help and see how that helps personalize everybody's learning, but also capitalizes on our strengths for our students to um, be able to help support one another and know that the instruction, the instruction doesn't just come from me as the teacher. I found in the public school classroom, I was always telling them what was important, and I, I didn't like that. I, didn't, I wanted them to learn from each other, and so in this environment, I'm helping the students see that they can learn from one another and that they have something to contribute, and I think that models real world, and it helps them to be successful and compassionate and understand others and be able to work with a diverse group of others who aren't their same age like in the public school. Um, okay, so I also have a very flexible environment, um, our physical space, our groupings, and the outputs that I mentioned earlier, and learning from and with each other. So I wanna show you guys some pictures to illustrate some of those things. Um, here I have um, my older kids working with my kinder kids, and we do this for five minutes a day. I just started doing this in January, where an older kid works with a younger kid and just practices their high frequency words and letters and sounds. And the, from the time I started it in January to the time I checked in with those kids um, in February about what words they had learned, like had acquired since then, and how their letters and sounds were doing, it skyrocketed. And all it took was five minutes a day where the kids are doing that personalized, differentiated opportunity with an older peer, but they have learned so much, they've grown so much, they also get to choose how they want to learn their high frequency words with their partner, which is incredible. Um, over here, I have a kindergartner showing another kindergartner some high frequency words, um, helping him to learn. She's needing some confidence, like a little confidence boost in her high frequency words, so I uh, had her partner up with this other kiddo, and it has built her confidence up tremendously, which has been awesome. So partnering them up has been really great. Bless you. Um, here I have whole group mixed abilities and outputs. Here we are doing a devotional, and um, this older second grade kid is um, giving an example to one of my kindergartners um, as to what we we're, you know, just illustrating an example to her. And then here we are working on our states unit. So that's um, our social studies unit right now. And I'm working with this group of kindergartners while these primary kids are working and they're doing their own research. And then we're talking about it all together. So that's another example of um, learning the same unit and also being able to uh, differentiate the output. And then differentiating activities here. The kids are playing the same game about money, but the... The rules are a little different for the kindergartners, where it's built upon for the older kids. And another example here is differentiating math activities to support one another. So these boys um, are working on their math facts, and they're listening to the other one do their math facts, but this is differentiated for their own level and their own personal achievement and their own personal goals. And so it gives that opportunity that every kid is learning where, they, um, where they're at and what they need. And then another example of kids supporting one another, this, um, this boy is helping her just to understand the directions and explain it to her from, uh, from another student, right? Sometimes those students explaining it to another student just helps it make more sense versus an adult coming along and being the one to explain, but also being able to be supported by peers and know that peers are another resource in the classroom is a great way to keep their relevancy and their learning and immersive within the community of learners. Hi, my name is Ashley Broadbeck. Um, I'm the <laughs> I'm the founder of Riverside uh, Riverside Educational Services. Um, I was a classroom teacher for ten years. I worked in charter, public, and private schools, um, and I resigned almost a year ago today um, from the school system. Um, 
and I thought to myself, I really want to do this micro-schooling thing like my besties over here, but it's May and school starts in August and I just can't. And so what I did was I, I opened up my own business um, with the very vague umbrella title of educational services because I didn't know what I was doing, let alone what it was going to turn into. And so this whole year, I have been doing a lot of private tutoring, some group tutoring. Um, I've done some workshops and classes. I had a reading class this entire year. Um, my daughter was supposed to be in public school this year. She was in kindergarten last year. And the goal was, hey, you have you got one more year in the classroom, babe, and then I can pull you because mama's got to figure this out. Um, but it was like a month into the school year, and I just couldn't do it. So I pulled her. And so her and I have been spending all day, every day together, which has been the, the best part of this whole journey for me as a mom. Um, and that's her right here in the pink. She's got the long Rapunzel hair. She won't let me cut it. Um, so just being able to work with her every day and the fact that I'm bringing other kids in is just, in my opinion, this extra bonus. Um, and so through tutoring, I've been, like I said, a lot of private tutoring. I'll do some reading classes. Um, but the, the thing I like the most about what I have been able to do is I have the freedom and flexibility to do what I want to do. And what I want to do is what the kids want to do. And so you see all the fun projects of um, slime, because what kid doesn't want to make slime for science workshop? Um, we get the computers out too. I do a lot of virtual co um, virtual tutoring too. Um, I'm in the middle of nowhere, Indiana right now. I came from California though, and so I still serve a lot of my California families through Zoom on the computer. We'll do tutoring that way. Um, one of the really big things that I want to incorporate into my micro school when I launch is just having this immersive experience for my students. And I want to share um, an example at a private or a previous school that I worked at where I did this and something I want to bring with me. Um, I taught fifth grade history, and it was the American Revolution unit. And so what I did was I convinced my principal to be a little um, flexible with me, and we're going to kind of reinvent some of the scenarios so that the kids can feel it. They can get angry about some of these issues that the, the patriots were facing at that time. And so um, at the time, I had a money system in my classroom, um, classroom budget, classroom management type system. And I would make the kids pay me for their homework worksheets um, for the Stamp Act. Um, I convinced my principal to pretend there was a water leak in the second grade classroom. So now the second graders had to share a desk with my fifth graders for the quartering act. And we were just all frustrated. Um, and then one, more, one morning before school, um, I get to you know, my classroom to go in. And the kids are already there. They're already like, the, the room is locked. But they're in front of the door. And they have signs saying that we're not coming to school if you make me pay for my, my work. And we're not doing this. Like, they started doing what? had happened in, in the past in the history. And so reliving those experiences is something I want to be able to create, at least um, in the social studies and science worlds, where we have a little bit more freedom and flexibility to teach these things in a more creative outlet. Um, another thing I want to incorporate is 21st century technology in the classroom. I think it's important, but like Hannah said, you know, screen time in our eyes, we can't do that. So what does that balance look like? And for me, I feel it's going to be more of, in the micro school setting, um, using that technology as, as a teacher almost, right? Um, for math and reading, I can do a mini lesson. And that's how I envision next year going. I will do a mini lesson with my group of students and then send you off to do something independently on an adaptive program like IXL or Khan Academy. It's one of my favorites I use for tutoring right now. Um, and sort of having a computer program be one of my teachers for the time being as I'm starting out. Um, and then in the afternoons, I'm planning to do science, social studies, and electives in that more freedom and flexible environment where I can have you reenact some of these things, where we can do reader's theater to learn about how things in the past and the history make it come back alive, um, because I feel like that's more entertaining than just reading a worksheet that I would have had to do in the public school, because that's what administration thought was the best thing. Um, so for me, it's having that freedom, that flexibility, and... Um, really just giving the kids what they want and, and to go from there. So as we talk about all these different ways that we incur incorporate immersive relevant learning in each of our micro schools and future micro school, but current tutoring, is there's obstacles and challenges. Like we wouldn't be totally straightforward with you if we didn't say this is tough sometimes, okay? And so we wanted to take time to talk about that. I'm specifically gonna talk about the field trips. Planning a weekly field trip, while it is compulsory because I'm kicked out of my location, it's forced me to be creative. But there are 
intentional logistics that I have to work out. And as I've grown, doing a field trip, I was at my kitchen table last year, planning a field trip for four kids is a lot different than planning a field trip for 15 kids. And so that begs the question, do we get a, a bigger van? Do parents chaperone? Like, how, how do we transport these kids? Um, does it cost money to go to the destination? How can we make it work? And so those are things you really do have to grind out, okay, and anticipate that there's, <laughs> there are logistics, and the, the reality is they have to be worked out in order for that to be a smooth sailing field trip. Um, and some field trips are so much easier than others. Like if we're going to just go on a park tour, we'll just go hit up playgrounds and just go have a social field trip day, and that's great. But if we're going to go to the optometrist or the college, there's different logistics that come with that. And so what works for my school might not be the same thing that works for your school. Um, and I can answer questions if you're thinking about them. But just know that logistics and costs, Vela has been such a huge supporter in making these field trips accessible. But it's also something that I built into my curriculum fees. I know that we're going to pay tuition on Tuesdays. And then there's also curriculum fees. So I use that money to fund the field trips. And I lean on parent chaperones to make the ratio safe and smooth. So. Okay, I want to really want to say because this was a learning curve for me. Um, Project-based learning as a new way to learn. So, this is so fun because, like I told y'all, I I took what I had in my mind and then I I kind of let go of that and let the students drive a little bit. And I knew that I wanted students to do projects. I knew that I wanted them to show me their learning through projects, but I didn't really know like. I was a middle school educator. I don't know what these students may or may not know, especially if they've been homeschooled. They might not have done like formal projects. So one of the things that I did was I was like, okay, we're going to learn about X, Y, or Z. I'm going to throw this at you, and I'm going to teach you how to use the internet for research. I'm going to teach you how to create a poster board for this presentation. I'm going to teach you how to present when you're speaking. Um, and it initially our first project how to meet a deadline like they're begging me for a deadline now they if I don't give them a deadline like that's huge um, but our first project they were so nervous and they're like reading from a card and they're like yeah, so the Iroquois are from and and so from that I took these children and I was like, all right, here are two wonderful things that you did, but also make sure that you're looking at your crowd. And I will say that you have to kind of let go a little bit so that they can prove to you like what they're acquiring. And it may not look perfect at first, but just to keep going with it and, and to know that kids are capable of way more than we can ever imagine. And an obstacle of cha um, and challenge of multi-age and personalized learning is that it's really hard to plan for, um, especially if you are used to planning and it comes naturally to you or just helps you feel better. Um, planning for multi-age and flexible personalized learning is really tricky. And so in that, um, I'm constantly like revamping my schedule and uh, making sure that I'm meeting this particular kid here or this smaller group here. Or, um, this group here and rearranging things in different ways to make it successful and sometimes that's um, in the moment rearranging things sometimes that's on a Friday when I don't have kids I'm rearranging our schedule and I think a lot of times um, we can look at that and think oh my gosh if I have to rearrange my schedule that means I'm failing or I'm not successful or it's not working but I think we have to also reframe our brains to know that um, in that that rearranging things we are being flexible to our kids needs and if we are doing that, we are successful, um, and that is huge. So be encouraged that if you're rearranging your schedule to make things work better, like it's in the long run for your benefit and for the kids' benefit, which is huge. And um, I think also another thing that I have tried to help with that obstacle and challenge is to create some structures or systems that are consistent but flexible in that moment. So like I shared with my students who were practicing high frequency words and letters and, and sounds, like that is our structure and I can change the words or change the activity very easily, but the kids already know the structure. And so even though um, it's 
may be a little bit different. They're familiar with that consistency and that helps everybody be successful. So it can be really hard to plan for, but also really rewarding when you do put in that extra time and rearrange your schedule to see like this student has changed um, direction. Maybe they're learning these concepts really quickly and I'm going to change their path. Another thing that is also tricky is that it makes it hard to buy curriculum and stay with like a certain curriculum book or something and so with that is a lot of flexibility in where I get my materials and what I look for and how I evaluate a curriculum or a project or something like that to meet my students needs and um, then planning and implementing that. And so to kind of piggyback off of Becky but from a tutoring perspective if you will when we're talking about instructional planning um, because I'm working with kids that are typically in the public school system right now, I typically don't start my work day until 2 o'clock in the afternoon because they got other things to do. Um, so typically my day starts from 2 until 8 o'clock at night, sometimes a little bit later because I do have those um, former families on the West Coast that I'm still serving. So in the mornings, I tend to do homeschooling with my daughter and plan that day's lessons. And what I have learned is that you can have the best lesson prepared and I'm ready to go. I got all my manipulatives. I'm set up waiting for Johnny. And Johnny comes up and says, Miss Ashley, I got a project. We're going to do that today. And it's like, oh, all that planning, you know, wasn't for nothing. I'll do it next time. But you have to be able to be on the fly and kind of go with what the kids want. And that's what I want to portray in my micro school at the academy next year. What do the kids want? I want this to be a kid-driven interest um, school. And so um, one of the things that I have done to kind of put my nerves at ease, because when I'm working with the younger kids, I know the content. I do serve some high school kids and they'll come in and it's not what I had planned and I'm put on the spot and it's like I freeze a little bit. Um, and so I use things like Khan Academy a lot. I use things like ReadWorks and Common Lit because it is K-12 to and you can type in either the grade level or the sp specific skill. And so when I'm put on the fly like that, having resources like that, um, even though I have this wonderful 60-minute lesson planned for you and you want to do something else, it's fine, we can adapt and, and move on pretty quickly through, through ways like that. So that's just a snapshot of some of the hurdles. Um, so to go back to how it's going well. Okay, parents and students do love it. I mean, at Masterpiece Academy, I have uh, some paraphrased comments, um, but Amy had said it's a very student-focused um, environment. Uh, Hannah cares that the student masters the topic before moving forward. And she's talking about math because her child has chronically struggled with math, but I'm not moving on. I'm going to fill in those bricks and then move forward, whereas in a system school, it favors the system. Um, I know I talked to one parent, and she's like, she's in seventh grade, but she's not doing seventh grade math. I said, I'm no longer teaching um, seventh grade math to your child. I'm going to teach your child math and we're flipping it where the student comes first um, and then Adrian um, he was one of my very first students but he's pushed um, beyond the basics um, and he knows it um, but he had to he was at a critical point when he was deciding if he was going to leave public school if he was going to go down the path of some very bad life choices or if he was going to change it and he chose to change and he keeps pushing for more, but he needed a support system. And so by providing an alternative education, he was able to thrive. So um, the, the two quotes that I have up here from parents, the first one is from a current family that I'm tutoring. And um, my eyes are bad. I can't read it from here. But I know it said something like how I was able to treat this student as if they're their own person, right? I'm in the classroom with 28 kids but it's not one group, I see 28 kids. And so it is hard, and I know that it will continue to be hard in a micro school setting with these multi-age um, classes that I know I'm going to be having. But as somebody else already mentioned, it's not really that different than a traditional setting. I'm not sure if any of you are, are teachers, but, but we do that all the time. Whether it's a single grade, we still map out their abilities. We have high, medium, and low. And so to me, it's no different. It's just um, maybe you're a high performing kid, and you're in the third grade, and you're with fifth and sixth graders, who cares? To me, it sound, it's like one of those cliche things, age is just a number, right, and not a creepy way. Um, but it is, and I don't think that the kids should be taught based off of their age number, but rather their ability level. And then the second quote um, is talking about the social studies project that I had already um, kind of touched base on, where I made the kids reenact a lot of the things from the Revolutionary War. Um, and I got that quote from Sally, 
this year, and I did that project with her son 10 years ago. So like it's still in their minds as one of their favorite fifth grade experiences in my classroom. And so I think that is why I want to promote that going forward. I want you to relive some of these things because it's going to stick a lot better. My first quote is from my daughter, she's seven, um, and I also get the privilege to teach my son too, he just turned six. Uh, she said, and this actually goes, I know I presented a little bit more on multi-age education and personalized learning, but this goes along with um, just my efforts in creating this space where they are learning, right? They're seeking out the information. And she said, I love getting to read books myself to learn the information about without having the teacher telling me what to learn. And I love that, like, that was my goal to work on this year, and my daughter, who did not know that that was my goal, like picked up on that and was able to articulate it in words. And I just was like, yes, it's working. This is wonderful. Um, the second quote comes from one of my family, uh, one of the moms of uh, students at my school. She has two children that come to me. And I think that's one of the really cool things about multi-age education is that siblings can learn together. And she said, our kids love going to Rooted Life Academy. They talk about learning together, sharing prayers for each other, and working both individually and at a peer level to become more confident. And I think that is just such a great piece of feedback from a parent who sees her two children getting to learn and grow together at school and support each other and then come home so excited about all the things. Um, and I love that because multi-age education, the kids get to learn together with their siblings and what a cool opportunity. I'm not going to read my quote word for word. I've, I have some, um, some things to share that um, are kind of empowering. Um, but one of the very first thing um, that one of the parents said was that homework is, uh, projects are better than homework. And I don't give homework, um, but the projects come home with the students because this, the students want to do them. And that is a huge change. Um, I, the students don't want to go to lunch. They don't want to go to recess because they want to finish their projects. And that's beautiful to know that we're offering something that all students can participate in. About half of my students are, are special education students, or they would be if they were in a traditional school setting. So to know that there's buy-in for all the students and all the students are able to be successful, I think that really shows that this is relevant for them, that we're not going to judge them based on a, a score, and that they may have a gift or talent that's hidden beneath that. Because I don't care about the scores. I don't care about the assessments. Like, I care about growing you into the person that God made you to be, which is sometimes, like, hidden inside, and we got to find that. So I think that's beautiful. Ooh, here's the best part. Are y'all ready? Yeah, girl, hit it. Okay, so here are some of our favorite resources. I know because I saw somebody just request me on Instagram. Um, but these are some of our favorite resources. I know you guys want them. That's our link tree. So if you scan that QR code, it will take you to what we put up links so that you guys will have access to everything that we've talked about, including our um, websites or Facebook pages or whatever. So, oh, I'm so proud. <laughs> this is beautiful. Um, oh, Q&A time, right? Yeah. I would just leave that one up. Oh, it's there. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes for some Q&A, um, so please feel free to ask, and you can say in general, you can ask one specific person, um, but if you have questions for us, we're super happy to answer them for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is more for Becky, but um, do you use technology in your micro school, and if so, like, how do you use it? That is a really great question. We haven't the kids haven't really used a whole lot of technology up until this point I this year I'm kindergarten through fourth grade and I really love that because I don't want them just to be on an iPad researching right so they have books that they're using to research with um, right now uh, which has been really great because I want them to know that books have information and we've been comparing like uh, the copyright dates of things and the information that we see amongst the different books in the future I actually did just purchase two um, little baby uh, laptops for them and we'll work on a typing program and then we're going to incorporate some different uh, resources like IXL but in a very minimal way. On Thursdays the kids get about 10 minutes on the iPad in, in a different capacity. Right now my kindergartners are on an app called Make 10 Plus and so I can choose a specific number that they need to kind of uh, work on and they can uh, sit there for a few minutes and like make matches to like 
tens of friends or friends of 10 or something along those lines, but it's very minimal right now. And I actually really love that. We have, four, I didn't mention this earlier, but we have four acres and I love that we can go outside and play and I want that to be their focus. I know that they have technology going on at home, like Hannah mentioned with um, that optometrist visit. And so I hope that these kids can figure out that learning can happen in so many other ways without the reliance of technology. Um, I'm not completely like no tech and I will build in a responsible amount of technology as we grow, especially in the future, we're gonna add on some older ages. And right now I'm working on those skills that the kids need to be independent, responsible, and motivated learners so that as they age um, about fifth grade, they can start taking on a little bit more um, online or virtual components to their learning. So right now we're in kind of this sweet spot where they're, they haven't been too introduced to technology as a learning tool just yet, so they're not reliant on it. I hope that helps. Any other questions? And feel free, if we didn't get to answer your question at this time, like feel free to reach out to us at any time. All right. What sort of reporting form or not do you provide to your parents? Not um, I'll go first, and I know, Hannah, you go all the way up to 12th grade, right? Um, we touched on this in the last session that was in here. Um, we, I do progress reports quarterly, but they're summary type of progress reports. So I report on their academic strengths, their weaknesses, and then some of their social emotional um, learning that I'm noticing. Um, I also see parents every day at drop off and pick up. So they have those kind of inform informal conversations and then we do offer um, parent teacher conferences just so that they can stay on top of it. I do use one program called Zern um, that is on the computer for math so their parents can see real time kind of where they are. Um, but otherwise that's, that's the kind of reporting that I have. I do very, very, very similar. I offer glows and grows regularly so parents know where their child is at. I also, in those glow and grows, um, give suggestions about how the parents can help work on those concepts at home so it really merges that partnership that we have but also brings learning um, just full circle for the kiddos. And um, anything that we do that is an assessment of sorts, I type up um, notes about and how the child is processing and progressing and the parents find it very helpful. I, offer, I also offer conferences for families too, um, but that, that before and after school conversation with parents is incredible and a great opportunity. Um, right now in the tutoring space, I, I only meet with the kids usually once a week, so it's kind of hard to give a, a cohesive report as often as I would like because I see them so infrequently. So I typically do about eight to 12 weeks. I'll do, like Mercedes said, a summary report, talk about the highs and the lows of what your academic goals are. Um, but going forward in the future, part of me can't let go of some of the traditional things from public school that have been ingrained in my brain. Um, so I, I will be doing quarterly report cards or progress reports so parents have that. Um, I plan to utilize Google Classroom because it's free in the sense of like a, a grade book so parents can see as the kids are turning things in how they're doing and what they're doing. Um, but then additionally, um, with those progress reports that I will hand out, I want to do um, quarterly um, parent-teacher conferences of some sort. So I think um, verbally talking with parents is the best way to talk about progress, but I know that parents want something physical to look at. So um, the progress report summaries, and then I plan to do things like Zern and IXL2, things like that, that have those progress monitoring data built into that. So staple a, a summary that I wrote with a piece of data from one of my components and call it a day. <laughs> I'll just speak to the high schoolers for a minute. I don't know how many of you are serving high schoolers. I found that at least in my area, I'm one of the only options for high schoolers. Um, but I do, part of the services that I provide is transcript generation. And so while we're doing unit studies, um, they're working right now towards a zoology credit. And I piece together the oceans unit study with birds and dinosaurs to make a zoology credit. And so I, I'm the one that does that assessment based on how they're doing. Additionally, with the unit studies, I use Gather Round Homeschool, um, and I, I think I brought some workbooks. If you haven't seen Gather Round, you want to see it, I got it. Um, but we look at their language arts progress, social studies, geography, and I'm giving a grade content-wise, but also on like the elective per se, so zoology, but they're also getting a credit with language arts as well. We kind of double dip a little bit. Um, but I also am pretty informal, lots of conversations with parents. Um, I use Zern, I use Reading Eggs, and all of that has lots of real-time um, data that I can provide to parents on the spot. I'm not very intentional about quarterly parent-teacher conferences or even semesterly. It's something that I have room to grow, but... Um, we have still five more minutes, so are there more questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. 
The Vela grant, yes, and I believe they're here as an exhibitor too, right? Yeah, um, so Vela has four times a year where we can apply for funding if you're... Go ahead. Sorry, um, I'm a Vela community connector for my area and they actually have changed a little bit about their time frame this year. Um, they just have right now a micro grant um, opening where you can apply to be a founder in their network and also apply for the micro, uh, the micro grant which is up to $10,000. The deadline is this coming Monday, the 22nd. Um, and then they also offer, if you have been a micro grant recipient, you can then apply for the next steps grant. Um, the qualifications and criteria are a little bit different for that and what they're looking for, but that is up to $50,000. And then they have a bridge grant that is up to, I think, $250,000. Um, they On their website, they have criteria for who they're looking for. And I think that has changed even since last year. They've, they've just recently, and um, told us as the Vela community connectors that their criteria has changed a little bit. They're, they're doing some clarification. And so the best place to look for that information is um, vela.org, I think is their new website. And uh, it has all of the information. It has um, how to apply for the founder grant and the micro grant together. And then they tend to put their timelines up as well um, on that website, so it's the best place. But they're looking for permissionless, innovative, non-traditional educators, or not even educators, but programs, or people who want to um, help serve us in this community. And it is absolutely incredible, inspiring, empowering. And the Founders Network has been an incredible space, too, to meet others in this same movement. And I just want to say, if you go through the, the grant writing process for that, um, I am an LLC. You don't have to. I don't think you necessarily have to be a nonprofit. Um, but I will say, the first time I applied, I got rejected. Okay, so if it doesn't go the first time, try it again. Okay, don't don't lose heart. Um, the first time, I don't. No one in here is from Vela, right? Okay, cool. So the first time I applied, I spent weeks on it, weeks on it, and then I was approaching the deadline and of the second opportunity, and I had 45 minutes to submit, and I hadn't started it. So I just regurgitated my whole heart on the paper, and I got it. So, I mean, just don't overthink it, because you know what you're doing. You know your heart. Just put it out there, and the right people are going to buy in. That goes for enrollment. That goes with funding, all of it. So just don't, like, try and shy away from who you are. Like, own it, okay? Other question? Oh, hi. All um, LLCs? Yes, we are all LLCs. Yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so do any of you have, like, non-traditional hours of operation? So I operate 9 to 12, Monday through Friday. So one of the threats that I've received is the 9 to 5 schedule. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, have you encountered that? Hundred percent. Sure. So it's a little bit twofolded. One, some people look at education as childcare, and I know that that's not my ideal parent. So those parents don't end up enrolling, and so it's a partnership um, for me. Additionally, we're looking at other community organizations that can do sort of, for me, after school care or other activities because the homeschool community in my area is really strong. Um, but honestly, a lot of the families that need the nine to five, they're not gonna find it with me and those aren't my people. And I received a pit point of advice yesterday, like you have to know who your market is, who is your student, who is your ideal person, and then go after it. And so my target audience is not the nine to fivers. And as much as some of them, if they want it to work, they'll find a way. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I've been a teacher for, for 11 years now and I'm still not a morning person. And so my thought was a 10 to two sounds like the ideal time for me and my, my brain. Um, and so when presenting this idea to parents um, for the academy next year, they're all like, <laughs> no. Just, no, that's not going to work for us. Um, and so I did cave, and I am going to be 9 to 3 um, because of the parent involvement that I had received or that feedback. Um, but to caveat my my problem now solution, um, a, a mother in my community reached out and said, hey, I have this crazy idea to do an in-home before and after school daycare program um, because she thought I needed the childcare. And I said, 
I don't need it, but I've got some families that I think will, and so her and I have been working behind the scenes to kind of partner up where my kids will get first dibs um, because she has, what is it, the, like the church van where she could come, the 12-seat, come get my kids and transport them to and from. So um, if you are in a position where you want to have a different non-conventional type schedule, I would, I would say look into different daycares or, or before and after school programs to kind of make your schedule the way you want it to be. I know we're just about to finish, but not tra uh, my tradition. My, sorry, my hours are traditional, nine to three. My schedule is not. I don't operate on Fridays, and so for my families, um, they've been creative to find like a daycare that will accept their child on Fridays or a family friend that's available on Fridays. So they have that as a solution, which I think is great. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for attending our session. Um, if you have additional questions, you're welcome to approach us at the end here. But thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. God bless.